Amen. Thank you, Pastor Eric. Man, love again, like I said, just coming together on Wednesday nights and uh, studying God's Word, but just singing and uh, giving praise to Him. And I can sit on the front row, sing as loud as I want to sing, sing as off-key as I want to sing. And uh, Angie wasn't here tonight, so I could clap when I wanted to clap. And, uh, and if I wasn't even clapping at the right time, uh, it's okay. And uh, so, uh, anyhow, so glad you're here. If you've got a Bible with you tonight, let's take it and turn to James chapter 3. And tonight we're going to pick up in a passage where James deals with the power of the tongue. And uh, it's kind of hard to believe as he's writing to those who are dispersed. They were facing a lot of issues, a lot of things going on in their life. Uh, but there was also uh, a lot of, sometimes we call it yaya, uh, back and forth and uh, all that kind of stuff. And so uh, tonight we're going to look at this passage and we're going to talk about the power uh, of words. You know, uh, words, and you'll see this in the outline night as we work through this, our words can have great influence over people uh, in a good way, encouraging them, strength on that kind of stuff, but also or directing, uh, casting vision, uh, doing that, or our words can destroy. They can tear down or our words can bless. I can remember the uh, first time uh, Angie and I, you know, uh, uh, we met right out of high school, and then I wasn't very nice through college. She broke up with me very quickly, uh, but then I got under I wasn't saved yet, but I got under conviction, I guess. Anyway, I knew that. My mama said, that's the only girl who's ever loved you, so mama was right. So anyway, I set my sights on her. And, uh, but I can remember the first time when Angie said, I love you. Uh, I love you. I'm going to stay with you. I'm, I'm here for you. I mean, those words. And, and ladies, I don't know if you realize this or not, whether you're married or not married, but your words have great power over men. I know you may say, well, my husband, he's a manly man, you know, and he, I say something, he's like, oh, he just grunts, you know. Uh, but I'll, I'll just tell you from experience being a man, when Angie says something like, hey, you're doing a good job, uh, I love you. You're so big and strong, you know. <sighs> okay. And uh, it kind of makes you do that. Uh, uh, you know, and so she's really spurred me on. And sometimes when uh, in our marriage relationship, <laughs> we always tell each other, if somebody's up, you know, if somebody's down, the other spouse needs to be up, you know, and vice versa. You don't ever get discouraged at the same time. But, but again, it has great power. So I remember the, her words do. And, and that is a, an ability that God has given each of us. Uh, with our mouths is the power of words to encourage and, you know, bless and do that. But also, as I said, words can destroy. I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but I remember the first time when someone looked at me and said, I hate you. Uh, I hate you. I can't stand you. And maybe you've had someone look at you in such a way and say, I wish you were dead. I mean, that's very terrible. That, but this the pain uh, that occurs uh, in that. Let me give you a, a word of advice to young men in the room who are dating someone. If uh, this is a bad scenario, so stay with me. I hope this hadn't happened to you recently because it, it'll probably be. Probably, anyway, I'm going to say it, so here we go. Uh, if, uh, if, uh, if you're dating someone, they call you and go, we need to talk. Okay, that's usually not a good sign. You know, it's not like we need to talk. It's usually like we need to talk. And then it starts out like we're just more friends than we are anything else. Okay, what she's doing, she's dumping you. Okay, do you get that? So if that happens, here's a word of advice from Pastor Archie. Do not let her see you cry, whatever you do, as a man. Come on, men, right? Man up. When she says, you know, we're just friends, and you say, yeah, that, that's exactly right. Yeah, we're just like friends, yeah. And she keeps on talking, just go, adios, and then go cry in your truck or car or whatever when driving home, okay? Now, I say that if you've ever been, had a broken heart, and probably all of us in this room at some point in our lives— in a relationship, maybe it's what we call puppy love when we were younger or something like this. Probably all of us have experienced that, okay? That's the power of words can bring great pain uh, and hurt, okay? Uh, and so uh, I can remember even sharing that with my uh, sons, you know, at times in their life. But it is a, God has really given us a privilege. Think about also, uh, when we think about the power of words, and it's, it's negative, I know, but gossip what that does to people. Um, sometimes when I'm teaching in, uh, well, for instance, sometimes in membership class I bring this up that uh, I can remember one time, this happened at Central, I think, because I tell them, I say, just be careful what you ask prayer requests for when you're asking for prayer. You know, you may say it's innocent. Here's what happened in a small group. Uh, do we have any prayer requests here? Oh, yeah, yeah, I have one. Okay, go around. Yeah, we're going to pray for that. Somebody raised his hand and go, yes, said, we need to pray for Brother Archie, 
and Miss Angie. Okay, now, in an innocent, you think, well, that's innocent. You know what that led to? Those words. You know, it could have been, hey, we need to pray for Brother Archie and Angie because he's passing the church, you know, it's all good. No, it, it was left in a situation. Next thing I knew, like, are y'all okay? What do you mean are we okay? Y'all okay? We okay? We're good? Yeah, we're good. Why? What happened? Well, this is how that worked out, okay? So, it'd be careful, you know, again in that. So, that's a little negative. I got to bring y'all back up. Okay, I got to move on to something else here. Uh, well, no, this is negative. I got to bring this out. Uh, Look at Matthew 15, verse 19. This is before we read James. So if you've got your Bible, flip over there. Matthew 15, verse 19. Uh, 15, 19, Jesus, he says, For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, uh, and slanders. Okay, so false witness and slanders, use of the tongue and that kind of stuff. The tongue is an expression of the heart. And we'll finish up. I'm going to give you the ending of this in the beginning. But if, if you're here tonight and you say, man, I really need to clean my mouth up, okay, then it's going to start by cleaning your heart up, okay? So if you say, man, I, I've got to, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm real quick to speak or say something or respond and this stuff, then it's a heart issue. So a lot of times things that come out of our mouth is an expression of what our, our heart is. Um, there's another passage of Scripture. Flip over to Matthew 12 while you're there. Let me read this into you real quick. Just kind of letting you understand the power of words, okay? Matthew 12, and this is in verse uh, 36. Here's what Jesus said also. Talking about words reveal character. He talks about this. But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for it uh, in the day uh, of judgment. Uh, for by your words you'll be justified, and by your words you'll be uh, condemned. One of the things I didn't realize, but a lot of scientists will agree with this, and, uh, you know, they're pretty smart, so I'd say I think it's true, but words create, you know, sound waves. So when you speak, it just goes out there, okay? Now, I know if you're like me, you can't hear very well. So if you're at the back and you say something, I'll never hear you say it. But just because I didn't hear it or catch it, those words are still going forth, okay? So a lot of words, let's say this, if the scientists are correct in this, all the words that have ever been spoken are still traveling out through there in those sound waves somewhere. And so when the Lord says you're going to be judged according to these words, you've got to realize that he hears everything that we say, okay? So, again, he's given us great ability and power of words. The first uh, sin committed in the fall of Adam and Eve when the Lord came to Eve, I mean, excuse me, when the Lord came to Adam, what did he say? He said, this woman you gave me, okay? He was basically blaming God, but he's also blaming the woman. He says, this woman you gave me. So it's kind of a blame game. So that's what we see in the beginning right there. And again, the power of words. Okay, let's read James chapter 3. Would you stand with me? James 3, verse 1. We're going to work through these 12 verses. Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. For we are all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble uh, in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. Now, if we put the bits in the horse's mouth so that they'll obey us and we direct their entire body as well, look at the ships also. Though they're so great and driven by strong winds, they're still directed by a very small rudder wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, yet it boasts of great things." See how great a force is set aflame by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. That's a reference to Gehenna, which was a burning trash dump outside uh, of Jerusalem. For every species of birds and a beast and birds, of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be this way. Does a fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? Can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives, or a vine produce figs, nor can salt water produce fresh? Let's pray. Father, again, thank you for tonight. And Lord, uh, I pray tonight as we read through this passage, work through this, study through it, help us understand the, the power of words to influence, to to give direction, cast vision, to uh, man, lead someone to Christ. 
uh, Lord, I hope we grasp it. But then also, Lord, I hope that, and I know, I know what's going to happen. We're going to be testing this. We're going to face a trial. Or something's going to happen. Something's going to come out of our mouth. And we're going to go, uh-oh. Uh, so, Lord, I pray that you help us grasp that they can also destroy, but also bless. Just in us singing, giving praise to you, Lord. So help us understand the ability you give us not to be kind of a loose lips, but to really think about, as we talked about last Sunday, think about what we think about. Yeah, but what's in our heart is usually what comes out of our mouth. So, Lord, help us in that. Lord, for someone here tonight does not know the saving gospel of you, Holy Spirit, I pray you'd touch their heart, bring them under conviction, save someone tonight. In your name we pray, the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Please be seated if you would again. Thanks for standing uh, for the uh, public reading of Scripture. Great influence. When he starts out here, he says, let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that you incur a a stricter judgment. Um, now, apparently in the context of this, here's what was going on. There were some of those who desired to be a teacher, be a leader there uh, in the church, and, but it was for the wrong reasons. This is, when you read this, don't, it, it's the idea, just a big, let me paint the big broad butt brush here stroke, is the idea to understand the seriousness and responsibility uh, of teaching. There's a little boy. He's not in here. He's probably in Iwanas. He came through the line while I go out there in the kitchen. And uh, the, the lady said, hey, uh, this is Brother Archie, you know. And then he says, uh, don't you get stage fright. And I thought, well, that's a good question. I remember asking that question. He said, all those people are looking at you. And uh, I thought, yeah, it's kind of scary, you know. And, uh, and, uh, but when he, thought, he said that, I just thought about because he was thinking on Sunday morning, you know, and, and people and all this stuff. And uh, for folks that are in a position of pastoring and teaching, leading, that do, not, uh, uh, do not deny the responsibility. It's a great opportunity and great privilege. Don't deny the responsibility, the seriousness of your words and your actions and what that does and how that directs people uh, in that. So uh, when you think about that, I mean, you think about, uh, uh, give you just an illustration, you know, John chapter 4, the woman at the well and Jesus speaking to her. This was a woman. And then we say, well, that's Jesus. Okay, well, Peter, today at Pentecost, well, that's Peter. Well, we just going on. But at the woman at the well, she'd been living, she's living with a guy, she'd had several men in her life, she was kind of an outcast of society. This is kind of what she, she had gone down some paths and other women didn't like her and she's at the well at noon and Jesus speaks truth to her, you know. He did not look down upon her. He uh, didn't condemn her, but he did not deny her sin either. I mean, basically, he brought her uh, a front to the face with her sin. And what was taking place uh, in her life. And then he, you know, acknowledges that he is a Messiah to her. And really the first that we see in doing it, a lady that he acknowledges that to. And then she gets gloriously saved. So he's talking about the power of the words of Christ. We know he's authority and he's God and he speaks. But also understand that when we're speaking and teaching, uh, that we are giving that direction and leading people uh, to the saving knowledge of Christ. So it is a great responsibility uh, that God gives us. So you got to, you know, you, it's, I remember when uh, uh, I was in Wynn, Arkansas. I might have told this story before. And, uh, man, God had saved me and uh, I, was, I was being discipled. I was young in my walk with the Lord. I was zealous, if we could say that, uh, hungry, uh, spiritual sponge, and so I can remember them standing up and saying, hey, we got a college and career class. I think that's what we call it. said, we need a teacher. And uh, does anybody out there want to teach? I mean, there's nothing, you know. And uh, I'm sitting there thinking, well, you know, uh, I am probably not qualified, uh, but I have a desire and really, my heart is for the right reasons. I did not want to be up front or anything like that, but I thought, I want to serve the Lord. And for me as a preacher, man, studying to preach, I love it because you're just studying all the time. I mean, I, I like that. And so I can remember going to the head, the chairman of the committee that was in charge of putting teachers in places, and uh, I went to him very humbly, and I said, man, and he knew me. I said, man, and he knew that, you know, uh, God had radically changed my life, and so I was about probably two or three years in Christ, and I was young, I admit, and I said, I, you know, if you don't have anybody to teach that college and career class, I'll be honest with you, I'm not sure if I know what I'm doing, uh, but I do love Jesus, and he saved me and changed my life, and, and I would like to try to lead that group. He looked at me, and he said, we're really looking for someone older. I said, okay. He put his hands up on his head like this. Lean back in the chair. We're looking for someone older. And so I, I thought, well, you just stood up on a platform in church 
and we're begging people for someone to teach this class. And I'm the only one that's come forward, and you don't want me. And there's a thought, you know, there's a thought in my mind. I thought, I must really be terrible. And that lasted for about one second, and I thought, I've just kind of got that man head bob going. I'm thinking, okay. You know, I know what God's told me. I don't know what God's told you, but I know what God told me. And so I said, okay. It really hurt my feelings, but this made me mad at the same time. I, I don't know if I call that righteous anger or not. But anyway, I was kind of, okay. Uh, and that thing languished and lingered and all that stuff. And, man, it wasn't uh, eight weeks or ten weeks. It circled back around, and I was the last choice and the only person. And, uh, and so uh, I began my teaching uh, with a college and career class. What I learned is if you have something to eat, college kids will show up. But if you have something to eat and you have something scheduled and they get a better offer, they are not coming to your house, okay? It's just the way it works. I learned that too. And, uh, and it, Angie and I just gave us a great love for students and ministry and that kind of stuff. And I say that because what was happening here, don't be afraid of uh, being a teacher, just understand the seriousness and the responsibility of that. And I'm telling you, God has, uh, uh, if he's given you, and, and teaching is a spiritual gift. There's a gift of preaching. When you look in the Bible, it talks about the gift of prophecy uh, in the New Testament. We're not talking about foretelling the future. It's a preaching gift is what it is. It's just a gift. Of, it's a black and white thinker. Um, I'm trying to think who would give you an idea of a preaching gift. Uh, it's this, you know, kind of like that. A teaching gift, and if you think, if you sit back and watch preachers, you will begin to see who has this gift of teaching, who has this gift of preaching. Uh, they're both sharing the gospel. It's just a different deal. And sometimes what happens, folks are drawn to people who have those type of spiritual gifts. You'll see it uh, even among those who are teaching in small groups, too, uh, in regard to that, that you're teaching. Man, if you've got that spiritual gift that God's given you, love to study, uh, love to expound the Scripture, don't be afraid of being a teacher. Just understand that he's very clear that you got to be careful about what you're doing and you got to be grounded in the scriptures. It, it is also okay if you don't know everything, but yet you're studying and you're preparing uh, to do that. When he talks about a stricter judgment, there is a, if you got your Bibles, flip over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 real quick. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 um, says this. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he's done, whether good or bad. Now, when uh, we read that passage there, there is a bema seat. There is a great white throne judgment that's going to occur for every unbeliever, for everyone who's not saved, for everyone who's not born again, all through the course of the history of the world. Uh, there is a... Great white throne judgment is going to happen. For all those who were thrown off the ships, died at sea, got put in the ocean, you know, they're going to their soul, their uh, spirit, they're going to appear before the Lord, and there's going to be a great white throne judgment. Name's not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. This is where, also the Bible says, and the books were open, okay, that in the the deeds are recorded of people in those books. Your name's not written in the Lamb, and the book was open, Lamb's Book of Life. Your name's not in that book, you're cast in the lake of fire, okay. Nobody wants to be at that judgment seat. But there is the Bema seat, which is a judgment seat for believers. Now, please understand, don't get this mixed up. You're not going to be judged for your sin at the Bema seat judgment because it has been forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ. Somebody has got to say amen on that one, okay? Amen, right? So our sins are forgiven. Jesus is not going to bring up and say, Archie, you are a sorry, low-down person. You did this and I can't believe you did that. No, that's not going to do that. What the Bema Seat Judgment is, is a place of rewards for those who have served the Lord, been obedient, okay, for every believer, uh, what it is. So there is that Bema Seat that's going to occur. Now, so what he says in adding a stricter judgment is the idea of the seriousness of teaching, but it can also be uh, in God's, uh, you know, working in your life, his will for your life, uh, of that judgment, the Bema Seat, maybe saying, well done, good and faithful servant. Uh, that's there. You know, maybe you're teaching in the, the outreach uh, of that. For instance, there was a Sunday school teacher in the 1800s, and uh, he was teaching Sunday school, and a young boy shows up, 18 years of age. Uh, he gets embarrassed in the Sunday school class. Uh, and you know it's called Sunday school because they really taught school on Sundays. That's kind of how all that originated in that. 
And, but he got embarrassed in the class because when they asked him to turn to the book of John, he did not know where it was in the Bible. And so the teacher kind of rescued him in that. And if you're a teacher, you'll learn this teaching small group. You've got to be very careful about it. Uh, how many of you, let's be honest, have words in the Bible you cannot pronounce? Okay. When you're like me, the preacher, you just kind of la, 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 blow through it real quick. Anyway, no, you try. Hey, there are software programs you can purchase that can have an audio system. You can punch on that word, and they'll pronounce it for you. I've got one of those. That, that computer, that woman on that computer said that word ten times. I still can't pronounce it. Okay, so anyhow. But you know the embarrassment if you're reading a word that you can't read or understand or, you know, that. So you have to be careful of that. Well, anyhow, this happened with this young man, got real embarrassed, uh, apparently left. The Sunday school teacher goes by where this man works. Probably heard this story, 18 years of age. He's a shoe clerk. And it says, the story is, that the Sunday school teacher walks to the young man in the room who's putting up shoes in the store, puts his hand on his shoulder and says, I'm concerned, something like, I'm concerned about your soul. And does the best he can his attempt of sharing Jesus uh, with this man. It's Dwight L. Moody. Okay, Dwight L. Moody. This Sunday school teacher introduced Dwight L. Moody to the Lord in the 1800s. And if you don't know who he is, go look him up. I mean, just his preaching and uh, evangelistic uh, zeal and, and all that stuff. So, again, the power words and just a, a Sunday school teacher who was nervous uh, but who was being obedient of teaching uh, and doing that. So, that's kind of verse 1. Now, it says, for we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man able to uh, bry the whole body. Now, what the tongue can demonstrate is our shortcomings. How many of you might have had... We're on anger in a couple of weeks, but how many of you might have had an outburst the past few days? Have any of you ever said something you wish you'd not said? Let me just say that. Anybody? Okay. Some of y'all didn't raise your hands. I'm so glad that you're so good. Okay, so uh, it's a privilege knowing you in that. So now I say this, though, because, uh, you know, it is an expression of the heart. There can be things that are in there that come out. Uh, there can be, uh, to say that is we stumble, we fail. Uh, we make mistakes uh, when, we, when we maybe get in a situation, do that kind of stuff. Uh, when Angie and I are doing premarital counseling with couples, uh, I, will, I try to ask questions like, who's going to manage the checkbook? Okay, we need to know that. And then and sometimes they'll look at each other like, we hadn't thought about that. I thought, that's kind of important. You need to come figure that one out. And then I, sometimes I'll go, who's going to wash clothes? And then they look at each other. I said, y'all might need to work on that one, you know, because the man's like, my mama washed my clothes for me. And the, the girl's like, I'm not your mama. You know, you're going to wash your own clothes. And anyway, never mind. Okay. I'm going to keep on doing marriage counseling. Let this thing's over with tonight. Okay. But, but what I always share with them is that when you have a conversation uh, because of the power of words in a marriage, and if you've been married for a long time, you understand it can be hurt and pain or lovely. I mean, you can do this, but I talk about elevating your voice, you know. When one spouse gets here, the other one does not need to try to top that spouse and go here because it does not end up well. You can start out having an argument, a discussion, let's say that, about how to hang your clothes on a hanger. How many of you men have a certain way you like your shirts to be hung on a hanger? Anybody? I saw a hand. Okay, yeah. Okay, you say, is that a man thing? Or How many women like you got a certain way you hang stuff? Okay, I'll do. You can start out by not hanging that shirt on the hanger in the right way. And it can get elevated because of the tongue to the point of where someone says, my mama told me I should not have married you, okay? Don't bring mama into the marriage deal, okay? That's not good, okay? So that's not even my nose. I have no idea where that came from. So what it does, the tongue can demonstrate our shortcomings. It can demonstrate what there. We can stumble. We can uh, make mistakes, uh, you know. It, but he goes on and he says, uh, if we put bits into horses' mouths, they'll obey us. We can direct their entire body. So what he, he uses the, the picture here of a, if, you've ever, if you're a horse person or whatever bit, you know, if, I'll, I'll, let me tell this story. I think I've shared this before. When I met Angie uh, at this horse show and I decided she's the one for me, okay? It took about five years to get to that place. But anyway, so I she's one of me. I go and uh, I tell the guys, I need to buy a horse. I need to come back with a horse next week. And they said, do you know how to ride? I said, well, I rode a Shetland pony. And they said, it's different. And, uh, and that's when they tell me, they said, there's a horse for $400. It's a pain horse. We know where it is. I said, okay. And so we're coming back somewhere that night. It's late. 
And I called with all my thug buddies at that time, okay, had my little running group. Anyway, we get to this guy's house like 1030, knock on the door. He turns the porch light on. We say, hey, we're here to look at buying a horse. He's like, okay. He comes out. And uh, I can remember being at the barn. He said, no, there's a pastor out here, and we had a light. It's a big old light bulb hanging down at the barn. The pastor's out back. He said, now, look, you just go out here and ride this horse around. His name's Buck. You know, he's a little high-spirited, be okay. We got the light here, you can see. And I can remember before I grabbed that saddle horn, him saying something like, have you ridden a horse before? I remember that. And so this horse had a bad habit when you grab hold of it and sling up. He would throw around like this. I don't know what that's called, and that's a bad discipline, but he would spin around. The point is trying to flip you off the other side. Well, I grab that. He spins around, and when he does, the bit comes out of his mouth and goes up on his nose. Now, here's what that means. No control whatsoever. And I don't know if he'd been watching the Long Ranger and Tonto riding that that horse or whatever. He took off out through the back. And my buddy said, all they could hear me going was, whoa, whoa. And and the guy on that horse says, there's trees in that pasture. Me and old Buck in the pitch black night with the bit on his nose went wild crazy, rode out through the pasture and came back. Now, because I was embarrassed... I acted like I knew what I was doing. And when he got back, I jumped off that horse and I said, sold, I'll take him right there, you know. Now, I say that because what I learned is, you know, have that bit upright and you get it in his mouth, you could direct him around when it's out of his mouth. Now, a small bit that directed a 1,000-pound horse, okay, it's the same thing of a rudder on a ship. And what happens is your mouth can direct your body and your actions, um, Sometimes I can remember telling Angie, like, uh, we, I, I said, I'm going to lose some weight. She's like, oh, yeah, really? Well, you might want to push that plate back, big boy, if you're going to lose some weight. Okay? Now, I'm like, I'm going to speak it so it's going to be so, you know, whatever. But uh, those words, just by saying that, like, I'm going to lose 10 pounds or something, uh, can, can steer your body. I've been with a man, if you're on a diet, I want you to go to lunch with me because we're going to go get some, we're going to go get some chips and salsa and I'm going to eat every chip in that basket right in front of you. I'm going to go, this is so good. Look at this right here. So I don't need to be your accountability partner on that. I don't know where that came from either, but anyway, that's what I do. I guess I taunt uh, Justin Arbuckle like, I eat these chips, man. So, but he's like, no, I'm not doing it. Okay. He says that out loud and what it does, it directs his body. So that's the idea here. He says, a tongue uh, is a small part of the body, but it boasts of great things. It is the, the power of words. It is the power of influence uh, of the tongue, can, can move and direct. Uh, I'll be with some church planners and, uh, and have a translator, and I'll spend a couple days with them. And I, I really want to talk about leadership and, and leading and creating teams and and to, to think about the, the, the impact and the influence that even in different culture and different contexts, but the idea of vision casting. Vision is a picture of a preferred future. I mean, the first time I heard those words, vision is a picture of a preferred future, or I read it. And I thought, and it says it's like a picture you hold up in front of you, and this is where you want to be one day. I can remember the power of that. And so here's what happened. God spoke that into my heart about campuses. And the, the, I could see that out there. And I would tell our team, I can see it. Sometimes I don't know how to get there. But what it is is that, is that direction uh, of that and how God does that. So anyway, they have great influence. But also words can destroy. Look there in verse 5, which is B. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. Basically, this is the idea that when words have fuel to them, just that small spark, and if there's fuel around, when I say fuel, just stuff and antagonism and all this, it can create such a great flame. Uh, I don't think I've shared this story with you. Uh, Ty and I have, uh, uh, we bought us a, a, a hay baler, okay? And so we're not any great experts on hay or cows or anything, but anyway, I had a hay baler. So we had this little Bermuda grass field, and it's real good grass, and, and so I had this used hay baler. And I'm just going down through there, you know, and uh, it's like a Saturday, and I'm just going along there, and I can remember getting ready to kick a bale out in the back. I don't know if you've ever done any baling hay, but kicking this bale out. And I remember turning around and looking. I was looking at that baler, and I have mirrors. I was looking at these mirrors, and I remember looking at that baler, and I thought, there's a hole back there about this big around. And I, looked at, I was looking through that hole, and I thought, there's something orange in there. What is orange in that green John Deere baler? What is that? 
You know, it's kind of slow thought process. And that bell gets kicked out the back, a round bell where I was around. And I'm putting the gate back down. And then I see stuff dripping out of that baler. I thought, what is that dripping? And then this thought came in my mind. I'm on fire. Now, I don't know if that's ever happened to you. I became the laughing stock of uh, around here. I was on fire. Now, do you panic? Well, yes, you panic, okay? Now, here's what I learned. A guy told me, he said, once a hay baler catches on fire, in about four minutes, it's gone. Well, he was correct. A very small spark created a huge flame. I called Angie. I said, Angie, I'm on fire. She said, and she knew where I was, and she was about three miles away, and she said, oh, no, I see the smoke. Here's the embarrassing part. So I called the fire department. I said, I'm on fire. They said, where are you? I said, can you ping me? Ping, you know, ping me or whatever. I said, trying to give directions. Hey, they showed up. They come running down through there. And if you don't know much about hay, it catches everything on fire. And because there's a lot of fuel because of all that grass. <laughs> they jump out, put the gear on. They're, they're responding greatly. And I'm just standing over there watching it. I'm just, I'm just at a loss. I'm just looking at it. And uh, I walk over and say, man, I'm so grateful for you guys. And they said, that's okay, Brother Archie. I thought, oh, no, you know me. You know, I thought you know me. And it was not, I'm not kidding you. It wasn't 30 minutes. I started getting phone calls. Hey, I heard you were having a weenie roast, but you didn't invite me to come. I mean, yeah, that's funny. Okay, sure. All right, so a very small spark. If you've been around farming, this happens in, in uh, uh, combines. It can happen and stuff like that. Now, here's what I have learned, and, and it's what we always do. It's the same thing in a combine. I mean, you can take an air compressor and blow that thing out. Why do you blow those things out with an air compressor? So that if there is a spark, there's not the fuel to catch. Now, here's the deal about the tongue. If, if you got stuff and you got like old dead grass laying around in that stuff, it can set a, a spark, a word, can make a tremendous fire. That's taking place. That's what he's talking about here when he says it can destroy, uh, it can tear, tear down. He says it's a world of iniquity. I mean, he mentions those words, uh, set among our members. But he uses, he said, set on fire by hell. And that's a reference to Gehenna. This is a place where Moloch, they, they offered uh, child sacrifices to Moloch, was outside of Jerusalem when it was under that control. Uh, this is where criminals who were executed would be burnt out there. I mean, this was the dumping grounds of stuff, okay? So he uses that idea about that tongue can be set on fire by hell, uh, can even be uh, driven by the enemy uh, to some degree. So words can uh, destroy. Now, so I don't know if you've ever faced that uh, before in a situation, but that tongue can become Satan's tool. So here's what's going to happen tomorrow. It may happen tonight. You're going to get tested in that. And you're going to have to think before you speak, why do we have teeth in our mouth, okay? It is to cage that tongue in our mouth sometimes. Have you ever just had to grit your teeth? Did anybody ever do that? You know, sometimes it's better to just grit your teeth and not say it. But you really want to say something, don't you? Huh? Somebody says something to you and you think, I don't want to say something back. We just got to clench that teeth. We got to, you, got to, you got to hold that in because, again, the words have power to destroy. But also words can bless. We'll finish up with this. He says in verse 9, with it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men and be made in the likeness of God. Now, I want to concentrate more on the blessing of that, the words of encouragement. Maybe there's someone in your life that you just need to say thank you to. You know, it's real good every now and then to just get a text, and it, this would be for any of us, when someone says, hey, I just want to thank you for being faithful. I mean, just out of the blue, okay, maybe you're having a bad day. I just want to thank you for being faithful. Uh, and it's kind of like, man, that's good. I mean, that's an encouragement. It, it, it blesses. So he says, with it, we bless our Lord. But what he's saying is you can't, you can't be blessing the Lord and then tearing somebody else down over here. That's why he says you can't have fresh and salt water out of the same and trees can't produce different fruits. 
but you can bless others. Maybe there's someone you just need to bless. Now, I'd say, number one, bless the Lord, okay? Bless the Lord, oh, my soul. I mean, say, Lord, man, I just bless your name. I give you glory. I praise you. I honor you. I say hallelujah to you. Or maybe it's just with a spouse where you just say, hey, I love you. You know, you, you guys have heard my story. My family was not verbal, you know, growing up. I, I never heard my grandfather, who was my best man in my wedding, really say, I love you. Not even when he got, you know, I'd tell him I love me on the phone. He'd go, me too. I've shared that story. I didn't know what me too meant, but he just couldn't say that, okay? It wasn't verbal. Maybe in your family, you tell somebody, hey, I love you. Maybe you just need to assure somebody, say, hey, I just want you to know I'm with you. Um, maybe you just need to say, we're going to go through this together. Uh, there's a lot of things we face in life. If someone will just come alongside of us and speak those words that will bring blessing in a life, say, I'm going to go through this with you. Hey, this is not easy, but I'm going to walk through this with you. If we go down, we're both going to go down at the same time. Now, that just is an encouragement uh, when that happens. So maybe there's someone, maybe there's a child that you need to bless them. Do you realize that? Uh, you know, it's a love language. A, a lot of love languages is verbal affirmation. Somebody, you can buy them gifts. You can wash their car, an act of service. You can vacuum the floor. Uh, you can do all this stuff. And, and by doing that, you're expressing that you love them, okay? Because really, that's your love language. Acts of service or kindness or quality time. When someone does that in your life, that's, that's really speaking truth that they love you. So you respond that way. So you're speaking two different languages. They're, they're verbal. They need to hear, I love you. How many of you would say your love language, now this can be in a kid too. If you're raising children, you may know. You ought to be able to look at them and figure out what their love language is. They want you to spend quality time with them. Or they want acts of service. They want you to do something for them. That's how they know love. Or they need verbal affirmation. Or their physical touch. You just need to touch them, and that's a communication of love. But how many of you would say, my love language is verbal affirmation? Anybody like that? Nobody's verbal? I like to hear. Hey, I want Angie to say, hey, big boy, I love you. I'm like, yes, ma'am. Come on. But I'm also, hey, really, you may see us holding hands. Why is that? She knows, man. Hey, when she's holding my hand, I'm like, I'm like Superman, you know. Okay, so if she says, I love you, and she holds my hand at the same time, I'm like, woo, you know. Now, who do you need to speak that into? You may have a child that... Their love language is verbal affirmation. You just need to say, I love you. Um, there is the power of words to influence, to direct, to cast vision, uh, to, to move people forward, to let them see uh, what, you know, what could be and what should be. Let me say that one more time. Your words can influence people and help them see what could be and what should be. Man, it's the power of those words, kindness and love. They can also destroy. They can tear down. They can hurt. And usually hurt people hurt people. Let me say it one more time. Usually what happens is that hurt people hurt people. And so maybe there's some fuel that's in here. Some We'll call it dried grass in there or something that's just, you know, that Come out. You may need to do some looking. So, but then words can also bless. So, if you want a clean mouth, you got to get a clean heart. Um, when, before I came to Christ, um, I ran with a group of people, um, you know, I'd, I'd say use bad language. And young men... We just use bad language and stuff. Wouldn't use it in front of girls. Would never use it in front of Angie. Uh, but use it. But when God saved me, He not only got my heart, but He got my mouth. Now, I wish I could say that it was just automatic. At the day that I got saved. <laughs> I will say what he did is he took dial soap and did a good washing on the inside. But when stuff that was in there, it had been forgiven. But whenever it would come out, that Holy Spirit, when it would come out my mouth, that Holy Spirit would grip my heart. Now, do I still fail and make mistakes? Yes, just like it says, we all stumble, you know, and do that. But if you want a clean mouth that will bless and influence and not destroy, you're going to you're gonna have to have a clean heart. And so this is where we are not. Maybe there's something in there. Maybe there is, uh, you know, working on this thing on anger. 
Sunday after next and just working through that passage and uh, uh, where that stuff comes from and how it boils up. Maybe there's a, some stuff that's in there. You say, Lord, I just give you control. I surrender completely to you. I submit to you. Lord, do a cleaning within me. Um, you know, maybe there is someone uh, who hurt you. And uh, because they hurt you, you hurt other people. And uh, maybe you just need to, uh, you know, say, Lord, I just lay this before you. Uh, maybe there is someone God has brought to mind. You just need to speak. Maybe there's someone that works with you that they're just downhearted and discouraged. You just need to speak a word of blessing uh, into them. You need to tell them they're doing a good job. Uh, you know, maybe it's a spouse or a loved one. You just say, hey, I care for you. I love you. I value you. I, man, I'm for you. Um, I'm with you. We're through this together. Maybe there's someone who's sick that's in your family, and you just need to say, we're going to walk through this together. I'm here for you, you know. Maybe there's someone you just need to say, I'm not going to leave you. Maybe there's a child. You just need to tell them, I am not going to leave you. There's a lot of words you need to speak into the life of your children because there's a bunch of junk out there, and there's insecurities and stuff that are happening, and... Uh, you know, there's just stuff. And so you need to speak words of encouragement into their lives and, uh, and words of blessing, you know, and do that. So maybe the Lord's put someone upon your heart this morning, or excuse me, this evening, someone you just need to maybe bless or you just want to bless the Lord. Okay, so we're going to pray. I'll be around afterward, if, man, if you want me to pray with you or talk with you and visit with you some more. Uh, but I want to pray. So let's just go before the Lord right now tonight. Father, just in the name of Jesus. Uh, we come to you, and Lord, I, I pray that we do understand the power of words. We grasp that, and the power of the influence, Lord, that uh, you have given us uh, to, to help give direction, direct in a godly way, uh, to, to help people understand who they are. And you, Lord, the, the power of words when we speak the gospel, tell the story uh, of you, Lord Jesus, and how just the story of you, death, burial, and resurrection, and how... Uh, Lord, through that story of the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit moves it just by speaking those words of truth that people come into a relationship with you. And so, Lord, if there's someone here tonight that does not know you, Father, I pray that, uh, Lord, there's that conviction of sin and there's that desire to repent and to be right with you and right. And that, Lord, right now they would call upon you and say, Lord Jesus, I love you. And, Lord, I'm a sinner. And, Lord, I repent of my sins and I ask you to save me. Uh, and forgive me of my sins. Lord, I, I pray that would take place tonight. But, Lord, also, too, uh, tonight, maybe there's a, a someone that has hurt someone here, and because of that hurt and pain, it's this lashing out that comes out. And, and Lord, we don't deny that pain or deny that hurt, but, Lord, I just pray you would heal that hurt. And so maybe even tonight someone just needs to pray and call upon you, Lord Jesus, and, and ask for a healing and renewing. Uh, and, uh, and, too, Lord, just to give the ability to forgive. And, Lord, we can only do that because you've forgiven us and not to hold that grudge or have resentment and stuff, Lord. So, Father, I, I pray. It's not, maybe there's someone that's come to mind that someone just needs to speak a word of encouragement into, uh, to bless them, to share with them, to maybe tell them just that they love them and care for them. Uh, so, Lord, I pray. Holy Spirit, I, I believe that, you know, you're the one who brings those things to mind. And so, Lord, I pray we'll take those uh, steps of action, whatever it may be. Lord, you're good, you're holy, you're just, you're righteous, and we just say amen, hallelujah, and thank you, Jesus. We pray this in your name, in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Hey, our men are here. They're going to take an offering tonight. Until we do this at the end, especially on Wednesday nights, not so much for the offering. Please don't, uh, you know, think that. But for the point of taking those cards up, if you've got a prayer request, uh, something's there. And you might, hey, it's okay to put on that card. If you don't leave it blank, you can say, it's a blank request. You don't know who it's from, but Lord, help me with my mouth, you know, and help me control my words. Maybe you got a situation you're coming into this coming week where you got to do something. And maybe it's a confrontation and where it just need, you just need wisdom and discernment. We'll be glad to pray for you uh, in regard to that. Hey, I want to encourage you to uh, uh, be here this Sunday. Uh, I think it's very important. I think there will be some folks that will be set free in any of our campuses as we talk about guilt uh, if you're like me and you have a past like me where you walk down some dark paths, okay, that stuff from the past is like an octopus in a way, you know. I'm kind of scared of the ocean, so I don't know a lot about that stuff. But anyway, they've got tentacles, you know, and just wants to reach out and grab a hold of you uh, and drag you back down. And so there can be something in the past where the enemy, the voice from below, the voice within says, you're not good enough, you're terrible, you're low down, you're sorry. 
Let me just encourage you with this. If you have confessed your sin before the Lord God Almighty, you've been cleansed and you've been set free. So that stuff there is not conviction of the Holy Spirit. That's just a guilt, emotion that's wailing up and doing this. Okay, so there, I believe this week, and, and the series has been really good, there'll be some folks to be set free. Some of you are dealing with stuff that you've been forgiven of, and you got to walk in forgiveness, and you got to understand. Now, some of you may be dealing with conviction that you need to repent of, and so that's another story, and we'll cover that too. So, again, we'll encourage you to be here, and then next week will be anger. Hey, God bless you guys. It's 20 after 7. Do not forget your kids tonight uh, as you leave, okay? Hope to see you back.